From our Toronto studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Aisha Ashraf. Our top story tonight, Congressman Jamal Bowman, known for his outspoken criticism of Israel, has lost the Democratic primary of New York's District 16 to George Latimer in the costliest House primary ever. Latimer's campaign spent nearly $15 million on the race. He received heavy backing from the pro-Israel lobby, including the powerful American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC. The centrist, pro-Israel politician now is expected to secure the district in November, which is dominated by Democratic voters. Bowman's progressive platform highlighted issues like Israel's war on Gaza and U.S.-Israel relations. The outcome has sparked criticism from progressive groups. They accuse the Democratic Party's elites of hypocrisy, decrying the influence of big money interests in primaries. Palestinian American U.S. Airman Muhammad Abu Hashim has resigned after 22 years of service. He cites Washington's unwavering support for Israel and its ongoing war on Gaza for leaving, which has killed over 37,000 Palestinians, including thousands of children. The Washington Post reports that Abu Hashim's aunt was killed and over 20 relatives injured in an Israeli airstrike, prompting his resignation. Reflecting on U.S. policies and extensive military aid to Israel, Abu Hashim has expressed emotional turmoil, stating, I can't be part of the system that enabled this. His departure underscores growing dissent within U.S. government ranks over its approach to the Israeli occupation of Palestine. This resignation follows the departure of senior State Department official Andrew Miller, who is also critical of President Joe Biden's handling of Israel's war on Gaza. Analysts say these resignations highlight deep divisions over U.S. policy towards the region amidst escalating humanitarian concerns in Gaza, where thousands currently face starvation in the face of an Israeli blockade on aid. In the last 24 hours, Israel has killed 60 Palestinians and injured 140 others in Gaza, the Palestinian Health Ministry reports. The actual number of killings may be higher, with rescue workers unable to reach some areas. Gaza's civil defense describes the destruction in Beit Lahya as unimaginable. At least 15 people died following an airstrike on the Abu Awad family home, which was sheltering about 40 people. In Rafah, southern Gaza, Israel's artillery shelling killed at least 10 people and destroyed several houses in a Saudi neighborhood. Additional shelling occurred east of the Burej refugee camp in Deir al-Bala in central Gaza, killing even more people. Israeli forces conducted a limited incursion east of Khuza'a and Khan Yunus with artillery fire targeting the north of Khan Yunus. Despite Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's statement that the intense stage of the war is nearing its end, Israel's war in Gaza continues. Since October 7, Israel has killed at least 37,718 Palestinians and wounded 86,377 in Gaza. Israel is accused of genocide at the International Court of Justice, which has ordered an immediate halt to military operations in Rafah. India appears to be supplying arms to Israel despite its long-standing advocacy for dialogue over military action. Al Jazeera TV reports recent incidents and revelations suggest India quietly is exporting military components to Israel. This has raised concerns about the transparency of these transfers. In May, the cargo ship Borkum, carrying explosives and weapons components from India's southernmost city of Chennai, was set to dock in Spain. However, it changed course after protests and political pressure. Documents reveal the vessel was carrying significant quantities of rocket engines, rockets with explosive charges, and other munitions intended for Israel's port of Ashtad, just 18 miles from Gaza. Another vessel, the Marian Danica, also faced denial at the Spanish port of Cartagena later in May. It was carrying 27 tons of explosives from India to Israel's port of Haifa. Spanish authorities, confirming the military nature of the cargo, refused entry to the ship. Notably, a video surfaced showing missile remains in Gaza with labels indicating Indian manufacture. India's engagement includes unmanned aerial vehicles. While India maintains these drones are for surveillance, they're used in combat scenarios, including Israel's current war on Gaza, 
remains a contentious issue. Former Israeli ambassador to India, Daniel Carmen, also indicated that India might be supporting Israel with military supplies. This gesture is reportedly in recognition of Israel's assistance to India during the 1999 Gargal War. As Israel's war on Gaza continues, a Palestinian man displaced by the shelling has made umbrellas from parachutes used in airdrop aid packages and opened a picnic area for Palestinians living in tents in Khan Yunis. Mahmoud Helmi, who took refuge in Nusirat camp and came up with the idea of opening a picnic area, started the project by converting parachutes from aid packages into umbrellas. Helmi explained that he started the project out of a desire to help displace people who have nowhere to go but tents and no private space. He says they developed the idea by using their limited resources to create an alternative. Surgeon General declares gun violence public health crisis. Details come after the break. Stay tuned and we will be right back. Welcome back. U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has declared gun violence a public health crisis, marking a historic move in national health policy. In his advisory, Murthy emphasized the urgent need for action, saying that firearm violence is now on par with issues like tobacco and opioids. The report underscores alarming statistics, revealing that over half of U.S. adults have been directly impacted by gun-related incidents. Murthy highlighted the disproportionate toll on children where firearm injuries now surpass other leading causes of death. As many as 54% of U.S. adults have either experienced a firearm-related incident directly or have a family member who has. The advisory calls for comprehensive measures, including stricter firearm regulations and enhanced mental health services. The announcement has sparked support from public health experts and advocates for gun violence prevention. The Oklahoma Supreme Court has blocked the establishment of America's first taxpayer-funded religious charter school. The ruling against St. Isidore of Seville Virtual Catholic Charter School marks a significant victory for advocates of church-state separation and public education. Attorney General Gentner Drummond led the legal challenge, arguing that the school's approval violated constitutional principles. Supporters of the decision, including faith groups and civil liberties organizations like the ACLU, hailed it as safeguarding religious freedom and preventing public funds from supporting religious teachings. However, proponents of the school expressed disappointment, signaling likely appeals to federal courts. The controversy underscores ongoing debates over the role of religion and public education across the U.S. Fundraising efforts are underway to upgrade Baltimore's oldest mosque. The project is part of the Masjid al haq 2030 vision and will expand and modernize the 154-year-old building. Masjid al haq was established in 1958 and holds significant historic and cultural importance. The upgrades and updates will be led by Leia Architects and include a new prayer hall, four minarets, as well as facilities for classrooms. They also include a public amphitheater, farmer's market, heritage exhibit, skate park, and basketball court. Four Black Lives Matter protesters in Seattle have been awarded approximately $700,000 by a federal court jury. The court ruled their civil rights were violated when they were arrested for writing anti-police graffiti in chalk during the Black Lives Matter protests four years ago. Those were sparked by the May 2020 murder of George Floyd, a black man in Minneapolis, by former local police officer Derek Chauvin, who was white. The jury found that the city and officers acted in retaliation against the four protesters, which it said violates the protesters' First Amendment rights. Each protester received $20,000 in compensatory damages, as well as $150,000 in punitive damages. Evidence presented in the court showed police bias and selective enforcement of anti-graffiti laws against Black Lives Matter protesters. 
Legal experts say this case is a warning against infringing on citizen speech rights based on content or viewpoint. The United Nations marked the 27th International Day in support of victims of torture today, highlighting ongoing global concerns, particularly in Palestine and Syria. The Convention Against Torture has been enforced since June 26, 1987. The day was designated an international day in 1997 to raise awareness and support for torture victims. Despite international frameworks prohibiting torture, violations persist due to conflicts and discrimination, underscoring the need for stronger UN actions. Recent reports highlight Israel's treatment of Palestinians and abuses in Syrian prisons, while Guantanamo Bay continues to symbolize prolonged detention without trial. These issues persist despite calls for reform and justice for victims globally. According to the Palestinian Human Rights Organization of the Amir Prison Support and Human Rights Association, 233 Palestinians died in Israeli custody between 1967 and 2023. Of those, 73 deaths resulted from torture. Since the onset of the civil war in March 2011, Syria has witnessed rampant human rights abuses. The Syrian Network for Human Rights reports 15,334 people, including 199 children and 115 women, have died due to torture. In Guantanamo Bay, 779 Muslim detainees have faced severe torture without formal charges or trials. According to figures released by Amnesty International, there are 30 Muslims now held in detention for more than 22 years without any trial. Among them, 16 have been abandoned to their fate despite proposals from U.S. national security agencies to transfer them out of Guantanamo. Four people have been killed and 16 others injured in clashes between the Army and the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, in western Sudan. The fatalities occurred in Abu Shu camp in Al Fashir in North Darfur state. The coordination accused the RSF of deliberately shelling hospitals in the city, citing the destruction of the only health facility in the city's northern part. There has been no comment from the paramilitary group at the time of publishing this report. On June 6, the International Organization for Migration said it recorded 9.9 .9 million people internally displaced in Sudan due to the ongoing fighting between the army and RSF. The conflict in Sudan broke out in April 2023 between Army General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and RSF Commander Mohamed Habdan Dagalo over disagreements about integrating the RSF into the military. The conflict has killed nearly 16,000 people, displaced millions, and caused a devastating humanitarian crisis in Sudan. The International Criminal Court, or ICC, has issued arrest warrants for Russia's ex-Minister of Defense, Sergei Shaigu, and current Chief of Staff, Valery Gerasimov, for alleged war crimes in Ukraine. The warrants accuse them of directing missile attacks on civilian targets, including power plants during Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These actions are alleged to have caused excessive harm to civilians and damage to civilian infrastructure. Despite the warrants, both officials are in Russia, which does not recognize the ICC's jurisdiction and has denounced the courts. Ukraine, though not an ICC member, has granted jurisdiction for crimes committed on its territory since 2022. Shaigu, removed as defense minister recently, remains influential as head of Russia's Security Council. Thousands of Shia Muslims gathered at Imam Ali Shrine in the Iraqi city of Najaf on Monday to celebrate Eid al-Khadir. Eid al-Khadir is an observance among Shia Muslims in Iraq and globally, commemorating an event known as Ghadir Khum. The Ghadir Khum marks a sermon delivered by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in 632 CE near the then settlement of Al-Juhfa on the path between the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Celebrations in Iraq typically involve gatherings in mosques and religious centers for sermons and lectures recounting the significance of Imam Ali's leadership. Community meals, charitable acts, and educational activities for children also mark the occasion, fostering unity and reflecting on the values of justice and faith within the Shia community. That's all from our Toronto studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon for the latest updates. Your support is needed more than ever to continue our mission of providing informative, educational, and inspiring content to Muslims in North America and around the world. 
Donate now by visiting muslimnetwork.tv slash donate. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Salam and good night.